Brendan Berg, Brendan, uh, would you like to? Yes. Thank you very much for accepting to to talk with us today. Eh? Okay. O Brendan ine kathigitis sto panepistimio tis Victoria, ke apo to 2021 θα είναι ο αρχηγός όλου του ακαδημιουργικού προγράμματος του American School of Classical Studies εδώ στην Ελλάδα. Ε, με όλους αυτούς τους φοιτητές, τους scholars που έρχονται από όλο τον κόσμο που μας προανέφερε η Jennifer, θα χειρίζεται όλο αυτό το πρόγραμμα ο Brendan. Και θα μας μιλήσεις, Brendan, what is the topic of your presentation today? Come over, please. Okay. <coughs> thank you. So thank you all for having me. Very glad to be here. Um, what I thought I would do today, I know you've seen a lot of presentations of throughout your jobs and your businesses. So I'm not going to give you a hard and hardcore archaeology talk. What I wanted to do today was to sort of highlight how archaeology is practiced here in Greece by foreigners, because this is my experience. And so I thought I would use the excavation that I've been directing and the project I've been doing for over 10 years now as an example to try to let you know how archaeology works here in Greece for Americans and North Americans generally. So I, have a, I do have a PowerPoint that will advance on this side and I'll advance this tablet too to give you some highlights of what I've been doing. How did we get here, I guess is the thing. I, when I was an undergraduate, I studied Latin. I came here as an undergraduate, I studied Greek, and I basically have never wanted to leave Greece uh, since I first came. So I really look forward to coming here again next year permanently, or for the three-year term as the Mellon professor. Um, so that's a great opportunity for me. Um, what I've been doing <clears throat> over the last 10 years, has I've been bringing students to Greece, uh, both to travel around as undergraduates, but also as part of the excavation I've been doing. And this project I've been doing is a, a true synergasia. We are a collaborative uh, project with the effort of Antiquities of Boeotia. And uh, we've talk, you talk about leadership and uh, strong figures and personalities. Um, we started off our project uh, with uh, Vasilis Aravantinos, who is a, a godfather of Boeotian archaeology. He's ba based at the Thebes Museum, not too far from here. And he was very helpful to me since I was, an under, uh, since I was a graduate student and my other colleagues from North America. Um, he retired in 2011, and now our synergatis is uh, Alexandra Harami, who is the director of the Thebes Museum, and has been incredibly helpful and supportive to us as well. So I wanted to get, get that out of the way, I mean, acknowledge their incredible assistance to us over these years. My collaborator is Professor Brian Burns uh, at Wellesley College, just outside of Boston. And so together, Brian and I, with our Greek collaborators, have been doing this project. So let me just um, show you where we are. If you can just advance that, if you can see there, we are obviously just about an hour and a half north of Athens. Our site is called uh, Ancient Elion. We are very close to the Tanagra Air Force Base. Perhaps you all know that, that famous Air Force Base that was so important for World War II. Um, and in 2007, we. What I wanted to highlight to you is it's not just simply you get off the plane and you start digging in a field. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. We had a system of research, a research design that we started off with what we call a regional survey. Tanagra was one of the villages where we did a regional survey. We walked the fields um, to collect sherds to get a, a very broad picture of the material culture in that area. We also mapped tombs. Many of the tombs were looted in the 1950s and 60s. Some of that material ended up on the art market. Um, some of them were systematically excavated. So it was helpful for us to sort of map those tombs out. We uh, continued our work in, in, to other villages, Arma and then Elionas. We did three different villages. What um, we were mostly interested in is the Mycenaean period. You've all probably heard of the Mycenaeus the Mycenaean age uh, from about 1700 to 1050 BC, we can say. This is the age of Mycenae and Tyrans, 
Pylos, the great cities there. Thebes itself is also a major Mycenaean center, and that's why I, I, I titled this talk In the Shadow of Thebes. As you can see here from this map of Greece, these are the Mycenaean centers all over. Crete was taken over the, by the Mycenaeans. Um, Mycenae, of course, is the type site the, in the Argolid near Nauplion. You've all seen Mycenae, most likely. Um, this was Homer's city, rich in gold. We have never you know, claimed to find material in any way rivaling what is found at Mycenae. But we do have a major Mycenaean center here at Elion. This is the grave circle at Mycenae, which had uh, the great treasures that were discovered by Heinrich Schliemann and his wife Sophie Schliemann, whose, arc, whose records are here in the Gennadius. This is might be confused with uh, Messini. It's uh, yeah. not, it's Mikines. Mikines, exactly, yes. Mikines. This is the so-called gold death mask of Agamemnon that Schliemann excavated, wrote to Kaiser Wilhelm that he stared into the eyes of the great Homeric king Agamemnon. Probably this is actually the gold mask that Schliemann saw, another mask from Mycenae, maybe not quite as um, dramatic as the, the, so, the so-called death mask of Agamemnon. But what he uncovered was a group of people that at that time were basically as thought of as legendary as, as the age of Game of Thrones or the Hobbits, for example. Like they all, people always thought the Mycenaeans were just this distant creation of Homer and his memory. But what Schliemann's work did was he actually proved that there was a great civilization here in Greece going back to at least 1700 BC. What later research showed too is that people were speaking Greek and this, that these Mycenaeans spoke the Greek language all the, as early as then. They had great ver and very elaborate burial tombs for their kings. Uh, they had uh, grave steely here and these so-called shaft graves. Um, yes, and the burials that take a big role because this is something we've been dealing with quite a bit. The material that were excavated, these are in the National Museum in Athens, a huge amount of gold, ivory, uh, ostrich eggs imported from Egypt that are elaborately decorated, um, inlaid daggers. This was a, a silver from Anatolia. Uh, this was a very elite group of people. They were large in stature. They were about two meters tall. There you are. <laughs> uh, some of them, they were very strong, healthy, uh, robust bones, but they showed injuries. They showed a lot of violence that, and their bones had healed. So they had good care. They were probably living a fairly violent life. So this picture that we get from Homer of heroes going off to Troy, sacking cities, conquering other people, you know, there is an echo of truth to this world that Homer creates as revealed by the archaeology. Um, people have studied the, the protein levels. We think they had better access to meat, uh, cattle certainly. Um, and then in the 1950s, another a Greek archaeologist, George Milanos, ex they were expanding Mycenae as a tourist site, and he discovered a second grave circle, Grave Circle B. It gave a longer history to the Mycenaeans uh, and their age. So um, the, material, the material from Mycenae helped us in a great way. So we leave the Argolid, and now we come to Boeotia, the area that I've been working in. And the site is called Ancient Elion. Um, we're near Chalkis, the great beautiful city uh, uh, for a weekend getaway in, in Euboea. Um, and the reason our site of Elion seems to have been um, settled in the first place is, because, is it controlled this very important corridor, a corridor that led to the Euboean Gulf. And this Euboean Gulf gave access, the, every, yeah, it gave access to the east, the Phoenicians came, the Greek alphabet was adopted by these Phoenicians he, through this um, access route. So what we did in 2007, we started walking these fields, as I mentioned to you, and we got a good feel for uh, the material at, the, uh, at one major site. And we've made a digital model of it, um, and we also mapped it out with a, a Greek topographer for survey, and we purchased the land. You have to purchase the land at, at ancient Elion, yes. Yes. But you've done a, a, a surface uh, survey, survey and, and you realize that there was something there. Exactly, yes. And so with the uh, survey, we had a good chronological range. We had Mycenaean material, we had archaic, classical, and we had medieval, Byzantine material. Um, 
What we were also able to do was put a permit application together through the Canadian Institute. I, I teach in Canada. And every foreign school here in, Af in Greece is limited to six permits per country, per year. So our project is one of the six excavation and surveys that the Canadian Institute sponsors. You can either do a regional survey, or you can do a Synergasia, three of them, or you can do three independent projects. Ours is the Synergasia version. Um, and so we've been successful in getting those permits each year. And it's, maybe you'll find it interesting. They, they are somewhat competitive. Lots of people want to get access to field work. The Greek government has created this system that's very effective. They trust the foreign schools, the American school, the British, the Germans, to administer the application process for their own school. So the schools pick the six permits that they want to put forward to the Greek government, and they get approved most, most often. Um, you have to have experience working in Greece. You have to have published material from a Greek excavation. Um, and you need to be affiliated with a, with a university. So again, it's, it's a control so that the quality is there. And, it, and I think it's a very good system. Um, so we did the digital model. We bought the land from a local farmer. Uh, 35,000 euros we raised. It was a good deal. V Vasilis Aravatinos helped us negotiate that process. Uh, because you can't excavate on private property. And it's a, I think you could probably appreciate this. We bought the land, we give it to the Canadian Institute in Greece, the, Greek, the Canadian Institute gives it to the Greek state. It is owned by the Greek state. All material stays in Greece. All material belongs to the Greek state, of course. Um, but the, our project has access to that land now to excavate as researchers. Um, what, sorry? Uh, it's about um, 100 and, let's say 14 four, 140 hectares, or 14 hectares, that's it, yeah. <clears throat> the other thing about that was important to us was that in Thebes in the 1990s, uh, public works projects were going on there. A new sewer line was being built, water lines were being laid, and um, a new cache of Linear B tablets were found. Um, and it happens that Arvantinos is a, gr is a great scholar of Linear B. No, in Thebes in Thebes. So in one of these tablets, um, here is the Mycenaean script. It's not alphabetic, it is a syllabic script. These aren't letters, these are syllable signs. But one tablet that came in, 19, in 1994 was extremely helpful to us. I know this all looks like scribbles, but these are place names. The first place is Tekaya, which is the name of Thebes itself, and a huge amount of oil and grain. The next two places are indecipherable. One may be a reference to Eutresis, a, a site we know, Ephthresis. And the fifth site, the syllables work out as E, Re, O, Ni. The R changes to an L. This is a reference to ancient Eleon. Um, and again, another a huge amount of oil and uh, uh, grain that are being assessed by the people there. It seems that this was a tax record that each people, each group of this communi these communities surrounding Thebes had to pay back to the palace each year. It's very interesting. It's just one year, one tablet, but it's helpful to us because it sets the place names up in an order that makes sense. So that these tablets date to about 1200 BC, 1200 BC. About 400 years later, the poet Homer is composing the great poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. If you know book two of the Iliad, it's famous as a demonstration of the great oral memory of Homer. It's the catalog of ships, all of the Greek troops that are sent off to Troy. It's, it's, it's to, Greek, to students of ancient Greek, it's very boring. <laughs> but to people who work on topography and mapping out different regions of Greece, it's very useful. Boeotia starts out the whole Greek contingent. It's Thebes and the cities around Thebes. Uh, that lead the group of uh, troops to, to uh, Troy. Eleon is one of those sites. It's on line 500. It's very easy to remember. Book two, line 500, is the reference to Eleon. There's other references to the site as well. Herodotus talks about it as a place famous for its uh, prophets. There's a seer from Eleon. But 
Uh, are there cities we have not discovered yet? Yes, yes in, in the, the catalog, catalog of ships? ships? Yes, yeah. Oh, and people debate them. Arne, for example, some have, yes, there are several of them. And some may be poetic, they might fit the meter right, they may be sort of fanciful places, but it's a very interesting roll call for sites uh, within uh, Greece. Yeah, the catalog of ships is amazing. So here's an aerial view of, of Thebes itself today from just from Google Earth. It is the home of King Cadmus, the, the great uh, legendary figure who is th said to have brought in the Greek alphabet. And many of the excavations that are done there today are, are in the modern city. And I think one other interesting thing about the excavations at Thebes, um, in terms of your business interests, is um, the connection to um, Hewlett Packard and David Packard, who is a great scholar in his own right, the son of the founder of, Hew of one of the Hewlett Packard founders, uh, got his PhD at Harvard. His professor was Emily Vermeule. She is a great was a great scholar of the Mycenaeans. She had encouraged his work as research. He created a computer program to try to decipher linear A. But one of the things she also told him or said to many of her students too was that Thebes was the great palace that needed to be excavated. Um, it would be a great thing if we could excavate this city and the, and the palace of Cadmus. The modern city of Thebes has grown up on top of it, so it makes it much more difficult. It's not like Mycenae or Tiryns or Pylos, or even like our site, which does not have a modern city on top of it. But uh, Vasilis Aravantinos is still doing work in this area and is working to map out the remains of the palace. And it's, the finds are truly impressive um, from, from Thebes itself. So it is something to rival uh, Mycenae and the other great centers. So there's uh, our, our, our helpful godfather, Vasilis Aravantinos. So we did our survey for three years. We walked these fields. Maybe this isn't so impressive, but we found sherds like this, very well-preserved sherds uh, that were washed and dated and we could categorize, categorize them. Um, what we also knew was that there was a very monumental polygonal stone wall at the site of Elion. If you can see this uh, drone footage that flies up through the site. This, date, this does not date to the Bronze Age, the Mycenaean period. This wall dates to about the period of the Parthenon, or a little bit earlier, maybe about 500 BC. And it's very strange because this wall has been standing since antiquity. We didn't excavate it, it has been there. But no one had explored this site before us. That also is strange uh, to us. Um, so again, we began our excavations in 2011 on a trial basis. We did geophysical work, ground penetrating radar to see what was underneath, if we could get a successful grant application and permit, and we did that. Uh, let's see if I can speed that along. <laughs> well, in um, 2012, we had a much bigger team. So we started off with about 30 people altogether. At our greatest, we were about a team of 50, all 10 or 20 senior staff. Many of them come from the United States. We have Greek students. We have Canadians, Australians as well. Um, and so it's been a, a very international project. Let's see if I can get that. OK. And um, what we have at the site from the archaic and classical period, let me see if I'm, uh, I may not be able to do that. When we first met you, I, I made a question. How, how can you tell whether this is Elion or not? I mean. Yeah. What are you hoping for? I mean, you don't know if this is the same. <clears throat> well, another ancient source we have, if you want me to, I'll, go, I'll be quick, is, is the, the geographer Strabo. Strabo talks about the Tanagri, Tanagrika, the region around Tanagra, and he makes it up with four villages. Three of those sites have been identified ah. and we know, are known. And the fourth one, which makes sense in terms of the orientation of these sites, is Elion. So we're pretty secure that this is ancient Elion. So we start from the top. We work our way down, obviously. Uh, we have archaic classical remains that go with the wall. We have figurines, female figurines. We think there was a cult to a fertility goddess, perhaps Aphrodite of some kind, uh, maybe connected to the nymphs. We don't know. Um, this is also connected to that wall. But we also know that in, the, in 500 BC, people were aware that this was a very old site. There were ancient remains. There was a tumulus there. I got to get this to work because it's important. <laughs> um, and so 
what we have from the um, earlier, le the later levels of the um, Bronze Age is, um, uh, let me get this there. Stop. Okay. Here we go. Good. We've had a, a huge, ugh. Why did that happen? Sorry, just a second. There. Good. So it's not easy <laughs> moving all of this earth. We don't have workmen. Old excavations in Greece would hire Greek workmen. Um, it was nearly impossible for us to do this properly legally. It, it sounds very strange. We worked with lots of different people in the Ephoria, accountants, construction workers. It never worked. What did work, we would bring big Canadian hockey players over and that were very helpful. Um, and, other, and, and, and lacrosse female soccer players, they were incredibly strong as well. So people, students especially, love this opportunity to be here in Greece. We live in Delice, or ancient Delion on the sea. We'd make a 25 minute drive each morning out to the site. And, and it, it's work. We would meet at six o'clock and make the trek out. But the village of Arma has been incredibly gracious to us and also the village of Delice. Um, what we find is that there is this elite population of Mycenaeans there that were mimicking the palace at Thebes. They had big drinking events. They had groups of people would come together like this. They'd have standardized drinking cups and pouring pitchers, and they would assemble. We think they were probably lower tier elites to people like the great King Cadmus at, at, in, in Thebes itself. They had bull figurines. Uh, we have imported objects of blue glass uh, material here for making jewelry um, that have good parallels for Thebes. We also have this, this is probably our most interesting find, which we at first thought was made out of ivory, um, but then we had our, our faunal expert said, this is actually made out of um, a cow's uh, knee bone, basically, the, the, the end of the femur of a, ca of a cow. Yes. In a, in a what, in a grave? Or? No, it was just on a surface. It's a very peculiar context uh, in a, on a good floor of about 1200 BC. It doesn't date to a grave, but it has inlaid eyes. Um, that it's, not, it's not exactly beautiful, <laughs> but we, we really like our, our man. He's about the, the size of a thumb. He was carved on, both, on just the front. He was probably inlaid uh, into maybe furniture of some kind. We're not really sure. Um, but the biggest thing was that what was there at, from 1200 BC was this satellite community reflecting Thebes. What we were, interest, we were surprised to find was that at lower levels, going back to 300 years, we, we found a cemetery. We didn't find settlement, but we found a very big cemetery connected to these early Mycenaeans. And it's this building that we're calling the blue stone structure because it's made out of a stone that comes from the area of Tanagra. It laid out a, it basically demarcates an area of, wow, it's about the size of this platform that we're um, seated on. The outline of it with flat blue slabs along each edge. And then in it, uh, we slowly uncovered uh, 13 uh, shaft grave tombs inside. Again, similar, but not in any way as grand as what was found at uh, Mycenae. We found two stelae that marked the burials. We found cobble surfaces too, that was very unusual. So these are grave markers. These standing erect stelae are unparalleled and we don't have them anywhere else in the Greek world. There's something at, on Crete that is roughly similar, but not from this early date. The grave stelae at Mycenae uh, were displaced. They were out of line. We don't have decoration on these two, but um, they are, these are the things that I worry about um, when I'm back in Canada, that they will fall over. We've conserved them, we have them securely fastened, because the, these were erected at about 1650, 1650 BC. It's very remarkable to have such a thing. Let's see. Can I get out? Oh yeah. So what we started to know, we started to see a pattern of how these burials worked, and we had a row of those small cobble stones that look that are about fist size. And our students, our director, the ex, uh, the trench supervisor said, "There is going to be a burial under there." And I mean, he wasn't he wasn't a genius, but I mean, we didn't argue with him because we agreed. So the students dug in this one area to remove that those cobbles. We found one of the largest um, slabs. Again, it was two meters of blue stone. So a very, very large single slab. 
we knew that it was so big that we needed help from the Eferia, which they gladly offered. They send out a crane and a very, very smart workman supervisor named Yanis, who is very smart and also extremely strong. He's like a, like a bouncer. And the, we lifted that uh, cover slab. This is just one of our tombs. I think I have this as a video, yes. You can see here it coming up. It's very exciting and also very... The time that you are actually lifting it. Yeah, this is the video. And I'm, I'm holding the camera, so I'm somewhat amateur. This is a shaft multiple layers. Yeah. And so what we found in there, um, we're very worried uh, if it was to make sure it maintained its integrity. We didn't want to damage it any further. Um, but what we found was... Uh, <laughs> Will that work? I gotta get this better. All right. Yeah. Um, we're three individuals. And there were two adults and a child in this burial. Here's the, here's the grave itself. So it was very exciting for us. We found this is our 10th of these burials, but this was probably the best preserved. There were bracelets still preserved on the wrist, um, a very nice bronze jug, another thing, beads around the neck, um, and these two unfired clay pots in the, in the corner. It was very strange. We mapped out the excavation of these bones very, very carefully. We're very respectful too, because this is the resting place for three individuals. This is so, you know, we are very, very serious. And I, 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 I you know, we never, we never take it, we never don't acknowledge how important this is because this is where people are resting forever. What we found and we're very surprised to found were textiles. I actually, I'm actually, a, my dissertation was on the production of cloth in antiquity. So it's a pretty good find for me. <laughs> um, these are wove, this was um, woven material that probably wrapped the body of that child. And the child was on one side and the two larger adults, they were about 20 to 25 years old, uh, were on the other side of the tomb. So it's hard for us not to speculate. We think that this was maybe a mother, a child, a father, and a child in this burial. And the child was wrapped up with the, with the other bones. Um, with the Wiener lab, we've been able to do um, some detailed uh, electron microscopy on this textile. We think it might be the earliest example of wool in the Aegean. Uh, we have some wool from Akrotiri, from, uh, from Santorini, um, and this one may rival it. We think it was inlaid. It was a very elaborate um, weave pattern itself. I'm, moving to, I'm coming to our end here. Uh, tomb 10 in uh, the red box here is probably, or this is tomb 5, sorry, is our largest tomb. Um, it has our most, our, well, our second most exciting find. Anyone have any guesses what that is? <laughs> This is ivory, so that's exciting, and it would have come from the Near East. This is the uh, pommel of a sword, so a symbol of something. Some we don't have the sword itself, though. We have the the butt end of the sword made out of ivory. A very elaborate construction as well. So what you're showing at the bottom right is not correct. This is from another burial, just for an example. This is what it was like in the in that tomb, um, and so. We do find a lot of very nicely painted pottery as well. I know many people may just glaze over their, their eyes with the pottery, but this is very nice poly polychrome. Uh, this is probably, let's see, one of these might be a Cycladic import, but most of it is early uh, Mycenaean or Middle Helladic. We have the minion ware as well. Um, and then finally, our, um, another tomb just outside the walls of the BSS yielded this uh, seal stone, which also is made out of very really nice rock crystal. And we debated on what, what was the design on this seal stone. And um, if you study Aegean art, um, oh, I guess I don't have the reconstruction of it. It's uh, a, an image of flying fish, a fish with the wings, a kind of, I forget what they're called. Maybe you guys are fishermen, you would know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And they show up at Falakopi in the wall paintings, the, the, the flying fish. So these beads were buried with another very, a very small compact tomb that has about 30 individuals in it. So there's something very, this, 
I should say, and again, I, I'm coming to an end here. We don't have to, I won't go into the full archaeology of it all, but it's very interesting that this grave enclosure, it separated people and it included people. So people were inside and people were outside. And it seems that... What do you mean separated? In which way? Well, that it, it doesn't have the whole population of the community. We do have burials oh, outside. The, the one marked with the blue stones. Yeah. So that was elite. An elite group, yes. But next to it, just outside the walls, we have a, a true ossuary uh, with about 30, the remains of, the minimum remains of 30 people. Exactly. And not even the whole person. So it's, it's as if you were, you died and were buried up on the hillside and someone in your family said, we want a part of that person here next to the blue stone structure because we will, we do get just random tibia, fibias that don't go with the rest of a body. So, so part of the ancestors rubbing off the glory yeah. of the elite, eh? Yeah, they're so. sort of curated and brought in and put into this uh, ossuary with these um, beads and other things and nice pottery as well. So it's a very peculiar thing and we're working on trying to map out the history of that um, just single tomb. It's very complex and the bones aren't very well preserved, but it's many individuals, very, very concentrated. So a lot going on there as well. So the, the great thing about our project is that we have been able to build up good relationships within Greece, uh, within, the the within the ephory of Thebes, of course, um, but also internationally. And so our bones, for example, they have been uh, part of this international ancient DNA project centered out of the University of Copenhagen. Um, and so I just sent them off by DHL uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> it was it was incredible. It really was great. I'm not just saying that. And and Copenhagen paid for it too. So yeah, I, they came at four o'clock in the afternoon. I know, and they were. You words. No, Oh no 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 no. Yeah yeah. So anyway, sorry, the ancient DNA analysis will help us understand the family connections of these individuals, will give us good dating, information on their diets as well. Did they come from somewhere else? And so that's been great as well. We were never scheduled to work as an excavation this summer anyway in 2020, uh, but we do hope to excavate in 2021. So we'll see if the permits work out, uh, if travel is allowed as well. Um, but the, the shutdown, of course, has certainly impacted people. We had teams of people who were going to come over and were not able to. So you were asking about, you know, have we been inf affected by this? And, and we certainly have. Um, and lastly, I, I should also show you, one of the things we do each year is within the community. And we, we definitely want to engage our, our um, the people around us who we buy groceries from. We go to the bakery every day. They want to know what are we doing each morning uh, six o'clock in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon in the hot sun. So we invite people up for our open house. And there is Alexander Harami from the Thebes Ephoria. Anyway. Talk to us about leadership in these times. Yeah. Right Do you have any notions? I mean, okay. I leadership. know that you want to be academically correct, but uh, if you can leave this aside for a while, how do you reconstruct, how do you imagine the society there? Oh, you mean leadership in the past? Was there a king? <laughs> was there, I mean, how strong was this elite? Yeah. Well, it, we tr actually, we want to use that word very carefully too. Uh, we map out that these burials were separated from uh, other, other individuals outside the, the landscape. They seem to, from this early period, they rivaled Thebes. They seem to be both going at the same time. Our group stops and Thebes rises and builds a huge palace. Mycenae is constructed and Tyrians is constructed. This center becomes secondary, and this is what we see in the Linear B tablets. So we're a, we're a smaller community within the, within the greater region. So this site, not we, the people of ancient Elion. Um, and we don't feel the, you know, we find that more interesting that, you know, we don't need to find the homes of Agamemnon and, uh, and Odysseus at, in Ithaca, we are finding the remains of um, a range of people from a long period of time. Um, so, yeah, we don't really, you know, think about leadership in the ancient world. I thought you meant for our excavation. How does that work? No. <laughs> no. Okay, clearly you are the leader in the excavation. 
Well, it's, it is very collaborative and it is necessary to have good relations with the Thebes Ephoria, with our previous um, effort, uh, Vasilis Arvantinos, my colleague Brian Burns at Wellesley, um, and our international collaborators as well, our specialists. So there's a lot that goes on. And also the Canadian Institute in Greece, um, I should not forget to mention, they are our, our other uh, partner in this, in this work. So we've been fortunate and we're very grateful to the hospitality we received and also that we have this opportunity to work here in Greece and it has been um, great. So thank you all for your attention. <laughs>